five minutes after the start time, so we've had the academic five minute delay uh, for students to arrive. Um, so uh, I'm Tadjarestrin, I'm the director of the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to this inaugural uh, lecture at UCL. And uh, it's just absolutely great to have inaugural lectures, uh, particularly <laughs> on my nice sunny day, so I think there's much that we can celebrate today. Uh, but before we hear the inaugural, and the inaugural is uh, the lecture that is normally given as a result of being promoted to professor in uh, most universities, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, so we have no fire alarms uh, planned. Uh, so if it goes off, we need to vacate. Uh, you can vacate around the, at the back, but there is also at the front an exit, um, and do take that seriously. The other type of alarm we would prefer not to hear is uh, one from your mobile phone. Uh, so if you have a mobile phone, uh, could you please put it on silent? Uh, and the last thing I'm really going to do uh, was to introduce what format of the evening is. And um, I will give a brief introduction uh, in a minute to Matia, who will then give his uh, 45 to 50 minute presentation, his inaugural. Uh, and then uh, Professor May Kassar, the director of the Centre for Sustainable Heritage, will give a response to that. It's the tradition in inaugurals uh, not to have uh, questions from the audience at the end of an inaugural, and so we would ask you to, uh, to stick to that. Um, for an academic, this is great to not be barred by either the students or uh, the rest of the audience. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be able to, to, uh, to be in that situation. Uh, I'm going to warn you that we're videoing uh, this presentation, so if anybody has any concerns about that, but since we won't be videoing any questions, um, hopefully most of you will, uh, will not appear in the video. Um, after the, uh, the um, uh, response that May will give, um, uh, we've arranged for a celebrated drink, and it's literally just outside this door in the same building, just across the corridor, and we'd like you to all join us uh, to celebrate um, Matthias in all group. Um, and I'm sure at that stage, if you do have any burning questions, I'm sure the team will ask over a drink at least. Uh, so it really is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Strinick. Uh, I'm sure he is well known to uh, many of you in the audience. Uh, and if you were to look at his CV, you would very quickly uh, realise why the university was so pleased to offer uh, Matea a professorship. Uh, Matea trained as a chemist at the University of Indiana, where he was subsequently employed. Uh, and in 2007, we were lucky enough for him to join us at UCL uh, at uh, the Centre for Sustainable Heritage, uh, which then became uh, the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage, where he's now uh, Deputy Director. Uh, he established and directs the MRES course, uh, in, and is Director of the MRES Science and Engineering in Arts, Heritage and Archaeology, CIGHAR. And uh, this is a very popular course, uh, which also receives UK government funding through its Centre for Doctoral Training, uh, which Matea is uh, a deputy director of. Uh, he's supervised 18 PhD students. He's managed 35 research projects with great titles ranging from nano restart to heritage smells. <laughs> and the results of that research have been published in over 140 uh, journals and book chapters. And they've been published in a wide range of disciplinary outlets, ranging from the journals of building environment, uh, studies in conservation, applied physics, cellulose, atmospheric environment, cultural heritage, and of course, heritage science. Plus, he also has a patent. <laughs> As a result of all of this work, he is heavily sought after to give advice and to chair various events and organisations, as well as holding visiting appointments in a range of uh, organisations around the world. He's a fellow of the in uh, International Institute of Conservation, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. 
And he's also been given many awards, including the very prestigious Ambassador of Science of the Republic of Slovenia for his outstanding achievements in science and international collaboration. Professor Strilich, I would like to invite you to deliver your inaugural. Thank you very much, Tatch. Um, I, I think I could listen to you longer, for longer. Um, and I think this is also the first opportunity that you've introduced me at a public event, and thank you for that. Conversely, this is not my first inaugural, and um, if repetition leads to mastery, I think this is it. I, I don't think I want to do another one, to be quite honest. Um, I, I thought a lot about the topic of, of this, uh, of this uh, lecture today, as one should, of course. And I, I thought I shouldn't focus too much on the research that I've done in the career, in the 20 years career as a, as a heritage scientist. And instead, I wanted to focus a little bit more on what heritage science does and what we do in, in this field. And I wanted to focus a little bit more on what makes this field unique. And I wanted to present a case for this field becoming a field of research of its own. And I hope I succeed. I could have um, started by um, presenting a policy case why heritage science is important. And we know that in, in England alone, heritage science um, supports heritage industry, which itself is a huge industry uh, that uh, brings uh, approximately 22 billion pounds income to England alone. And we know also that heritage science is a field of scientific research that is particularly popular with uh, women students. For example, in the Center for Doctoral Training, CIHA, which Taj mentioned, we have 66% of uh, women students, which is a huge success for a science and engineering field, where in, on average in the UK we only have about 13% women. So there are a lot of really good reasons why heritage science is an important discipline. But I want to make an academic case for why this should be a discipline. And there are all sorts of narratives to go with this uh, opening slide that I've used for promotion as well. It has nothing to do with women in science, but it has everything to do with uh, the fact that I'm really excited by looking at numerous objects and by understanding why no two objects are really the same why they all degrade so differently, and why each individual heritage object is so incredibly unique. Not just because of the values that we attach to those objects, but also because the materials in each individual object are, are slightly different. And as a scientist, it excites me to collect the data and to understand those differences. However, I also want to uh, I also want to present the case that heritage science, uh, contrary to what many of us might think, is not a new discipline. Heritage science, heritage science has been practiced for several hundreds of years, actually, and one of the first uh, problems that has been studied by scientists was degradation of historic leather. And this was done in the early 19th century, actually, when um, gentlemen in libraries and gentlemen's clubs um, realized that the surface of historic leather gradually decomposes as a consequence of acidic gas that's been used for lighting in those clubs and as a consequence of coal burning in fireplaces. The person who first uh, discovered this process and researched the process was a chemist. And his name is known to many of us, Michael Faraday. Um, and actually, he was trained as a bookbinder, but then went on to become a world-known uh, chemist. And he, taught, he lectured about the process of leather degradation in the Royal Institution Lecture in 1843. So, in a way, he was one of the early heritage scientists. And it's not unusual for heritage scientists to do heritage science or research in the field part-time for a period of time in their career and then go and do something else. And I'll return to this topic a little bit later as well. 
We know that materials degrade. We know a lot of processes that lead to degradation of cultural heritage materials. And we can men measure and monitor heritage environments to a level of accuracy beyond what is needed for their successful conservation. For example, in a, pro in a project that I was uh, part of in 2008, and that was very successfully uh, coordinated by a London-based uh, company called Sensive, we developed a sensor or rather a range of sensors and we attached them to a microprocessor and we were able to monitor not just pollutants but also temperature, relative humidity, different types of light, UV radiation and dust at the same time. All of that is technologically possible and we know how to do it. We know the processes that lead to material degradation but I learned two things in this project. I learned that it's possible to do measurements to a level of accuracy beyond what we actually need in conservation and um, that we know actually very little how, how materials interact with environments. And the second thing that I learned is that um, if you're ever going to develop a prototype that doesn't look like an off-the-shelf product, and if you're going to um, monitor a display case at the British Museum, then uh, you better put a label saying this is not a bomb next to it. <laughs> so we know that what heritage science does it has a lot to do with environments and with heritage materials. But is that all? In order to learn more about <laughs> what heritage scientists do, I shouldn't look at my career, I should look at broader strategy documents and I took two strategy documents that describe what heritage science, that explored what heritage science does, at least in the UK and uh, particularly the, f the first two reports of the National Heritage Science Strategy published by the then English Heritage in 2010 are concerned particularly with the various contexts and the various types of research that heritage scientists do. And I produced a word cloud based on those two reports and this is what the, the word cloud comes, with, comes up with. We see that the word cloud tells us the typologies of heritage that heritage science mainly looks at and these range from materials and objects to collections but also to very complex objects such as buildings or even archaeological sites and uh, heritage sites, but also at heritage data, so digital heritage as well. So what heritage science does, it looks at cultural heritage across a number of different typologies, from individual materials to very complex assemblages to heritage data. And the expertise that's required to tackle all these complex uh, uh, contexts is uh, too broad for a single person to have. What, these, what this word Klaus tells me, however, is not how or for what purpose we look at these typologies of heritage. In order to do that, it's actually quite useful to look at the titles of the two reports. And the titles tell me that heritage scientists act, look at heritage management or management of cultural heritage and, uh, and at understanding of the past. And I think this very, very successfully and succinctly summarizes what heritage science is. It's the science of management of cultural heritage and the science of understanding of our past. And this covers the very breadth of research questions that heritage scientists are concerned with, I believe. And in the following next sli few slides, I'm going to present an academic case, I believe, that justifies why heritage science is a field that, um, that could be defined a science field of its own. It is incredibly interesting that um, it is possible to find research groups in different countries that, un that are concerned with very, very different cultural heritage. For example, in this country, because of the interest of the public and because of the interest of the public institutions, research into contemporary and modern materials is particularly strong. 
But in some other countries, research into plastic materials such as this would be, considered, would be considered as completely useless because there are no public institutions interest in the, interested in this typology of heritage. And this tells me that heritage science is a culturally dependent discipline. It's, it probably also depends on the layer of society that we, um, th that we engage with. For example, the layer of society that engages with eBay values this doll at two pounds. The value of this doll to me, however, was four scientific publications. <laughs> because that's exactly the number of publications that we published, trying to understand how these dolls degrade. And I can tell you a lot about the degradation of cellulose acetate, which is the body of the brush. It's, uh, it's a polymer that degrades by emitting, cell, uh, by emitting uh, acetic acid. It is a polymer that degrades particularly fast because of the acidity of this material. And it's a polymer that emits plasticizers and because of that it shrinks during aging and forms cracks. And because of that it becomes structurally unstable much before the bristles start to show signs of degradation because the bristles are polyamide and that degrades a little bit more slowly. I, I could talk for very long about, <laughs> about how we image the processes of degradation because at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage we developed a, te a technique called quantitative hyperspectral near-infrared imaging that allows me to image the rates and the uh, extent of degradation of this particular brush to, to an extent of accuracy that probably is not needed, but it's really, really quite interesting to be able to image the degradation across this doll. Now, what's, uh, what I believe is really important to, uh, in, in the field of heritage science is also that no two of these dolls are exactly the same. And it's possible to look at small differences as these dolls <coughs> degrade and as their degradation is appreciated by scientists like myself. The next case that I want to make is the case that heritage science also contributes to the value of cultural heritage through the very nature of the work that we do, because we promote the cultural, the cultural heritage that we research. And sometimes cultural heritage is generated by scientists uh, themselves. For I'd like to give an example of a collection at the Natural History Museum and uh, this, is the mineralogical, this is the mineralogy gallery at the Natural History Museum in London, a very, very beautiful place, exhibiting an extremely interesting collection called Ru the Russell Collection of Mineralogy. <coughs> it is beautiful in its own right, and it is visited because <coughs> of the beauty of minerals, but the collection itself is valued by experts, such as collectors, such as mineralogists, um, such as um, students of geology, and they visit the collection for different reasons. And those different reasons tell me that this particular collection is valued for many different, uh, because of the information that is extracted from this uh, collection in many different, in many different ways. And when we ask the experts themselves, what is the information that you value in these objects? These are the responses that we got. And what's interesting is that the materiality of the object doesn't play a role in the information that, ex that is extracted from the objects. What experts are interested in, what experts are interested in are the location of where the object has been collected, the date the composition of the object, the, uh, the name of the person who collected the object, everything except the object itself. <laughs> it's interesting that the information value of this mineralogical collection is in the metadata that scientists have extracted over the years and, per possibly as mu as, and this is possibly as valuable as the materiality, as the objects themselves. And I think that's very, very interesting. And in a piece of research that Jane Robb has done during her master's in 2013, 
uh, she looked, she surveyed this uh, uh, mineralogical collection and she found out that out of all the instances of degradation th in this collection, only 25% of those instances were concerned with the objects themselves. And approximately 75% were related to the metadata and loss of metadata. This tells me that we need to perhaps rethink how we manage conservation in such instances. The third case that I want to make is that heritage science being an applied discipline and looking at heritage or art is not an experimental discipline because heritage itself is not an experiment. It would be absolutely impossible to entirely and completely reproduce an art object. Of course, heritage scientists look at model objects, they model environments, they model processes, and in doing so, a lot of those experiments are repeatable and it could be called an experimental science. But as a matter of fact, when looking at a historic object, we're not performing an experiment on an object that could be repeatable. It would have been entirely impossible to build a reconstruct or to build a, a replica of this 13th century Armenian church, let it undergo all the environmental and social processes that led to its destruction and arrive at exactly the same layout of the ruins. So we could say that heritage science is inherently biased because of that. Whether that makes it a scientific discipline at all or not, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> Sometimes, especially when looking at large collections of, for example, archival objects, we're tempted to think that those large collections are actually of very, very similar, if not the same material. Paper was described by a very good friend of mine, Jan Wouters, as a very boring two-dimensional polymeric material. <laughs> and I couldn't disagree more with him, because no, no two sheets of paper are the same, and not because of what's written on them, but because of the chemistry that goes on in those sheets of paper. As a chemist, I'm excited by the fact that because of all the microenvironments in which paper degrades, because of all the processes that have been used to produce paper, no two sheets of paper, having undergone hundreds of years of aging, are now exactly the same. And understanding the value of those differences and what those differences mean to conservation of such large collections, I particularly, I find extremely exciting. And in order to understand those collections, it is really, uh, it is really quite important to collect historic materials in research institutions such as the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. And a lot of other institutions that I know have started to collect reference material collections because it, the only way to learn how actual heritage materials degrade is to collect similar materials and learn about, say, paper on the basis of such reference collections. The, the other reason why I'm showing the reference paper collection at the uh, Institute for Sustainable Heritage is because this has been collected within the uh, project um, Servenir. This was a sixth framework European project that I had the pleasure to uh, coordinate. Um, things were much less bureaucratic then. And uh, the, the other reason why I'm showing this is because in the frame of this project we produced a spectroscopic instrument uh, on the basis of near-infrared spectroscopy, on the basis uh, using which it's possible to measure in a non-destructive way the properties of historic, uh, of historic paper that lead to such paper degrading ever so slightly differently. And the, reason, the other reason why I'm showing this instrument is because it, it tells a very interesting story of knowledge creation within a project, within a large collaborative project, which I enjoyed very much. But at the end of this project, a spin-off was created who then ended up producing this instrument, so value started to be created. And then 10 years on, the same company invests in our students at UCL 
And I like how this cycle of knowledge creation and value creation can be so efficiently closed. In collections of very similar objects, however, I hope I've presented the case successfully that no, that no two of these objects will degrade exactly in the same way. So we need to learn how these objects, uh, what the, the individual differences among these objects are. And in the various projects in the last 10 years, we, were, we successfully developed a model of degradation, which we call a damage function, and we examined how this damage function can be used in the, in the context of collection management. However, as a scientist, I find it impossible to make the decision when a collection should no longer be cared for, and I'm thankful for that. And in order to inform that decision, we asked users of heritage collections to see how long conservation needs to be planned for. And we engaged with a number of lay users, so readers and um, those who access paper-based collections in archives and libraries. We, questions about, we questioned about 600 of them. And we also engaged with curators and collectors and researchers of geological collections. So we engaged two types of public, expert and non-expert, and in two contexts of heritage, uh, in two contexts of material durability, so paper, inherently non-durable material, and rocks, which will, all things being equal, last forever. And yet we got the same pattern of responses. <laughs> and this tells me that while we have about 20% of complete optimists, <laughs> with whose answers a scientist cannot do anything because forever is not a number. <laughs> Approximately 80% of, uh, of our public would be quite happy if our long-term planning, long planning horizons in conservation management were about 500 years. Whether that's a lot or not, it's difficult to say, but approximately 50% of our public would be also happy with a planning horizon of 100 years. So approximately three generations. What this tells me is that um, conservation and long-term planning in conservation probably has less to do with our attitudes and values to cultural heritage that we're trying to preserve but rather more with our general attitudes to the future. So if, let's say that we take this as our long-term planning horizon, and on the basis of our knowledge of paper degradation, let's model how the reference collection of historic paper at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage might degrade into the future. And what we arrive at is a demographic pyramid. We're now using social science techniques in order to understand how those small differences between individual objects might affect the degradation or the lifetime of an entire population of objects. And the same techniques are used in social science because we're looking at those small differences in variables that affect our population of historic paper. And we see that our population will degrade in two waves. The first wave represents acidic paper. The second wave represents alkaline paper. So all fine from a, from a chemical uh, point of view. And we see that in, approximate, that in 500 years, approximately 90% of the collection will still remain in a useful state, meaning that if I turn a page, it won't break, provided that it's stored at approximately 18 degrees and 50% relative humidity. So what this plot allows me to do is to develop management techniques that, based on the thresholds that we decide as a society, or that curators need to decide uh, on the basis of the value of their collection, on the basis of these plots, we can devise story, uh, we, can, we can decide what conditions of storage or what conditions of use we might need in order to keep the collection for the, for the uh, foreseen threshold of either 100 or 500 or however many years. So, for example, if I look at slightly higher temperatures, 
let's say that um, the Institute for Sustainable Heritage decides to move to a small Mediterranean island, <laughs> then this is what might happen to the collection, which suddenly be end up with only 50% of the collection in a usable state in the next 500 years. And I can assure you that the Institute will survive that long. That's the, the last case that I want to make, make for heritage science is that it, it leads to better engagement with cultural heritage. And it does so also by providing copies or digital embodiments of cultural heritage because it is inherently more convenient to access heritage digitally than physically. It's also so much easier to access different layers of information within heritage digitally. For example, by doing robotic three-dimensional scanning of heritage, uh, which for the uh, at present doesn't exist, but I'm showing this particular picture of a horse being scanned using robotic scanning techniques because in our laboratory at Here East, we're going to build a robotically enabled 3D hyperspectral scanning system, uh, the first of its kind in, in globally, hoping that we're able to provide 3D embodiments of cultural heritage objects that enable us to query the structure as well as the composition of heritage surfaces very, very conveniently and what isn't possible um, in, in the physical sense. <clears throat> but in doing so, we still need to take into account the values that users of such digitized or digital cultural heritage hold in terms of access to such heritage. We did a piece of research in 2013 uh, with the master's students where we looked at the attitudes of genealogists and historian researchers within the archival context of the National Archives of the Netherlands and we looked at how they valued the provision of digital copies versus the provision of physical originals. And we found huge differences and I think we understand very little about the expectations of our digital publics towards digital copies or digital embodiments of physical originals we see that genealogists didn't value the evidence that, uh, valued the evidence of, or rather, didn't value the evidence of physical object as much as they did that of digital objects because they valued the convenience of access. Historians, on the other hand, disliked accessing the digital copy because they distrusted the digital embodiment. They distrusted the digital copy. And I think we need to learn more about how people access heritage digitally in order to provide copies or in order to provide digital embodiments of heritage that researchers, visitors or users more generally need. In these few slides, I hope I presented the case why heritage science is unique and is worth be becoming a discipline of its own. But in the next few slides, I want to explore who heritage scientists are and where they operate. I looked at the publications, uh, academic publications, that heritage scientists published in the last decade, and I came up with this really interesting plot, which, which tells me that UK heritage science is right there at the top with other major nations producing top quality heritage science and something that we should be proud of. Well, this plot also tells me, if you sum up all the percentages, all the shares of publications together with all the other nations that I didn't plot, we get much more than 100%. What does this mean? This means that heritage science is done very, very internationally, that a lot of publications are co-authored by people from many different fields, from many different countries as well. So heritage science is inherently collaborative and inherently international, which makes all the sense because heritage is shared and international as well. 
In a piece of research that we've done in the frame of the Science and Heritage Program, the Mind the Gap project, that explored the perceived gap between users and consumers of heritage science research, which, by the way, doesn't exist, we found out. Uh, we, all, we queried about 200 heritage scientists who have been involved in heritage science projects a couple of years prior to the project. And we found out that approximately the half of our researchers who we surveyed were active in universities, but the other half produced academic research and produced academic publications very happily in non-academic institutions, in museums, galleries, libraries and archives. Heritage science is done in such a variety of contexts, it's mind-boggling. It's also really interesting that only about a half of, our, uh, of, our, uh, of, of the researchers that, that, that we surveyed came from science, technology, engineering and maths background and the other half came from arts and humanities, social science and other backgrounds. This tells me that in order to do social science well, you need access to all those disciplines because jointly they make up heritage science. And to prove that there is no gap between researchers and users of heritage science, we found out that approximately 30% of those we surveyed couldn't really identify themselves with either the one or the other category. They considered that they were both researchers and users of heritage science results, which is interesting and tells me that heritage science is itself a very, very applied discipline. We do research in this field, but we also use the results of our research almost immediately. It's extremely difficult to estimate the number of people involved in heritage science and the way I've gone about, is, about this is that I looked at numbers of academic researchers, whether at universities or elsewhere, in the UK and data exists for 2011, which is when in this country we had 160,000 active academic researchers who published about 16,000 papers that year. In heritage science, in that year, we published about 240 papers, meaning that roughly, as a rule of thumb, there must be about 2,400 people involved in this field. So it's not a very small field. But I think that there are a lot of people, like Michael Faraday, who do heritage science for only part of their career, and possibly part-time, and then go on and do something else. There are probably very few people, lucky as I am, who do heritage science full-time all the time. But we hope to change that. We hope to change that by bringing and taking heritage science to people, by taking heritage science to visitors and users of cultural heritage. We want to promote citizen heritage science because, after all, tools are becoming available that are very low cost but still accurate enough with which it's possible for visitors to historic sites or for visitors to collections to perform um, spectroscopy or material characterization or environmental analysis and contribute data that's extremely valuable to the few heritage scientists or to the few conservators amongst ourselves. Because although Although, uh, taking into account the entire conservation and heritage science community, it's still impossible to cover all heritage that there is in this country. We need the help of visitors and users of cultural heritage. And, by, and through, heritage, uh, through citizen heritage science, this should be possible. There are other ways of engaging with the public. And um, in the frame of the Center for Doctoral Training, sorry, Center for Doctoral Training, uh, Science Engin and Engineering in Arts, Heritage and, and Archaeology, one of the first investments that we've made was to uh, purchase a mobile heritage laboratory. There were two reasons why we did that. Firstly, because we wanted to take our kit, our infrastructure, our laboratory elsewhere in the UK, there are 2,000 regional and local museums, the vast majority of which have no access to its scientific instrumentation. 
But the second reason why we did this is because we wanted to involve the public in heritage science much more strongly. Uniquely, heritage science can engage the public in both science and cultural heritage at the same time. And I think that's a big benefit of what we can do with the public. And finally, the reason why this is a, an exciting time for, culture, for heritage science is also because in this country currently we're building a research infrastructure for heritage science, a distributed infrastructure in which 13 institutions are currently uh, taking part and that will allow access to, in, to laboratories and infrastructure more generally to people wanting to do science at these institutions. And this is also part of a broader European research infrastructure in heritage science, where with our European colleagues we want to take the model and provide access globally, if not across Europe. And the other reason why this is a really exciting time for heritage science is because of the, because of the Center for Doctoral Training science and engineering in arts heritage and archaeology, which is by far the largest single investment of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research, Con uh, Research Council in this country. And our remit is to train 60 heritage scientists in the field. It's entirely humbling to be in the presence of 30 PhD students, 30 smartest people that I've ever had the, 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 the pleasure to work with. And it's incredible to be, able to, be part, to be able to be part of this. Which takes me to my last slide, which is when I'd really, really like to thank those who I believe have helped me to make the right turns in my career to end up in this lecture room tonight. It's impossible to name all of them, but there are a few who really influenced my path in the last 20 years. And when I think of what they did and how they influenced my research path, I think that most of these people are incredibly practical about, the, about how science should be used in the context of cultural heritage, and also very practical about how cultural heritage should be managed. And I think I value that. And of course I need, to, I need to thank both May and Taj for having supported me for the, last, for the last 10 years and for having interviewed me in the first place. <laughs> and um, I vividly remember one of Taj's questions at my interview. And the question was, well, Mattia, what do you think is the, most, is the single most critical moment in a research project? I thought for about three seconds, not because I didn't know the answer, but because I didn't know how they'd take the answer. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Taj, um, the most critical point is who you take to do the job. <laughs> it took them about a nanosecond to start laughing. And at that point in time, I knew that if I were given the job, uh, I'd be entering a research group that had a sense of humor, <laughs> but uh, that I would feel welcomed in. I also want to thank UCL more generally, because uh, without the extreme cross-disciplinarity of UCL, I don't think that heritage science could blossom as much as it did at this particular institution. And I value incredibly, incredibly all the research collaborations that I've built across UCL in the past 10 years. And I'm absolutely indebted to all the, ma all the masters and PhD students without whom much of my research wouldn't have been possible at all. And finally, I want to thank my partner and my, my, my family for having supported me uh, throughout my life and my career. Thank you very much. Stay up here for the response. Okay, uh, thank you, Matthias, for a fantastic presentation. I'd now like to invite Professor May Kassar, who is the director of the uh, UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage, uh, to give a response. I can't match that, so I'm going to be brief. 
Mattia and I met in April 2004 at a European Commission project clustering meeting in Brussels. <laughs> in the same year, Mattia was nominated by the European Commission as a member of the International Scientific Committee for the sixth European Commission conference to be held in London in September of that year on the subject of sustaining Europe's cultural heritage from research to policy. This was our first opportunity to work together, so thank you, European Commission. <laughs> in 2006, Mattia contacted me as he was interested in a six-month sabbatical. At the time, the center, which is now the Institute, carried out desk-based and field research, but not lab-based research at all. We had an environmental chamber, but I don't think that really counts. So we met in early 2000 and, uh, 2007 for a coffee at Costa on Tottenham Court Road or Torrington Place, somewhere in that area, by which time we had taken the strategic decision with the support of the faculty, with the support of the Bartlett, to plug this gap in our capability. So I was able to follow up Mattia's approach for a sabbatical by asking him if he was interested in applying for the post of senior lecturer. I still remember vividly, this vividly as a watershed moment for the center. Mattia started at UCL in October 2007. As you said, we're just short of 10 years. So reflecting on a decade of sustained academic excellence, the question I have had to think about addressing is which of his many illustrious achievements should I highlight? We cannot underestimate Matthias contribution to the development of collections demography, an integrated approach to collection modeling which involves new methods of collection surveying, development of damage functions, and understanding of decision making. As we've heard already, Mattia is actively involved and involves users in social science research into heritage values associated with heritage science. He is committed to the development of citizen heritage science and active public engagement with heritage science more generally. He deserves recognition for the development of quantitative hyperspectral imaging of heritage and the robotic development of that at Here East, out in Stratford, will be an exciting development. Mattia has unfailing commitment to innovation with industry and public institutions that have been involved in all the research projects that he's done throughout his career. And there is increasing significant media response to Matthias' research. His last paper on heritage smells was picked up by more than 250 media outlets across the globe. Matthias is indeed an ambassador, not only of heritage science, but of science as a whole. And as we've heard already from Taj, last year, Mattia was recognized by his birth country, which bestowed on him the highest national award of ambassador of science of the Republic of Slovenia. <coughs> if I were asked to summarize Mattia's views on heritage science, I would look no further than the blog post that he wrote for the National Heritage Science Forum in April 2015. In it, he made the following statements. One way or another, we have been doing heritage science for ages. Heritage science is culturally dependent. Heritage science is inherently biased. Heritage science can be neither fundamental nor experimental. Heritage science is multivariate. 
Heritage science helps to interpret heritage. Heritage science provides evidence for sustainable conservation. Through improved access, heritage science contributes to well-being. Heritage science is proof that there is no world of two cultures. Heritage science urgently needs to develop its identity. I should like to end this short tribute by congratulating Mathia on his appointment as the first professor of heritage science in any university. And to say that I do not know of anyone today who has done more than Mathia to shape heritage science research and teaching, and by extension, to shape the identity of the heritage science profession. Congratulations. just leaves me to, uh, to thank Ray for her response, Mattia for his uh, absolutely fantastic presentation, and I think we're all glad that he does spend 100% of his time, <laughs> full time, all the time, working on heritage science. Uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, support team who organised this fantastic event, arranged everything, um, they're probably actually outside, but uh, I'd like to thank them very much for that. And last but not least, to thank you all for coming here this evening, and I hope you're all able to join us for a celebratory drink uh, next door now. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you.